So today a video for beginners explaining a 555 oscillator chip and some simple circuits with it. Like an LED blinker and a beeper, or even a beeper with two frequencies and a variable frequency blinker. I will show the schematics of these circuits, but first let's explain what all the pins of the 555 oscillator chip do. A 555 oscillator chip has eight pins, and in reality it looks like this. And there are different versions from many different makers, and they're making this one for over 50 years now. It's a very common chip, and for beginners in electronics, very often the first chip they learn about. First, let's take a look at the pin 1 and 8. These are the supply voltage pins. Pin 1 is the ground, connected to 0 volts, and pin 8 is the positive supply voltage, and it's typically from plus 5 to plus 15 volts from a DC power supply or from a battery. And then it has two outputs, pin 3 and pin 7. And this is a logic chip, not an analog chip, so the outputs can be just in two states, nothing in between. And the outputs are switched by internal transistors in it, which you can imagine for simplicity as switches. And the pin 3 can be either switched to the zero volt rail, the ground, or to the positive supply rail. And then there is another output, pin 7, called mysteriously discharge, acting sort of similar as this one, but it only switches to the zero volt rail or to nothing. And they're of course synchronized, they always flip at the same time, but this one connected to the pin 7 only switches to the ground, not to the positive. Of course, in reality, this output is an NP in a transistor with an open collector, but let's not make it too complicated. So these two pins are the outputs. They work like switches, but what makes these switches flip? They flip based on what happens at the inputs. The 555 chip has two main inputs, the pins 2 and 6, plus an additional input, reset. The outputs can flip based on what happens at the inputs. First let's take a look at this input, pin 2. When the voltage at this input goes below one third of the supply voltage, the switches flip up. This output gets the supply voltage on it, and this output is disconnected. Now they are basically flipped into the upper position here. So now we flipped the switches up, and how do we flip them back down? When the voltage at this input, pin 6, goes above two thirds of the supply voltage, they flip back down. So they are again in this position, both outputs connected to the zero volt rail or ground. So one input flips the outputs up when the voltage goes low enough, and one flips them down when the voltage goes high enough. And in most oscillator circuits, these two inputs, pin 6 and pin 2, are connected with each other. So they basically work as just one input, which can flip the outputs both up and down. And there is one more input, which is not used very often, is the reset pin. And this flips the outputs down when it's connected to zero volts. But in most cases it's unused, you can leave the pin unconnected, but it's better to actually connect it to the positive supply rail. To basically disable it so it has no effect. And of course the inputs have some priorities. The reset input has the highest priority. So if this is connected to zero volts, it flips the outputs down and it doesn't care about the input 6 and 2. And then input 2 has a lower priority, and the input 6 the lowest one. If you, for example, pull pin 2 under one third of the supply voltage and pin 6 simultaneously above two thirds of the supply voltage, the pin 2 has a priority and so the outputs flip up. But this never happens when these two are connected with each other, of course. But now let's build a very simple oscillator out of it. The pins have an inverting effect, so it's easy to turn it into an oscillator. When this pair of pins is pulled higher, the output goes low, and when it's pulled lower, the output goes high. It's inverting so it can form an oscillator, when basically the output goes back into the inputs. But of course it shouldn't be connected directly, it has to go via a resistor. Now with this feedback, it's basically an oscillator, but it would oscillate extremely fast, so we have to make it slower by adding a capacitor to the inputs. And the higher the capacitance, the slower it is, the lower the frequency of the oscillator. And also the higher the resistance of this resistor, the slower the oscillator is, or its output frequency is lower. Now the circuit oscillates, but we can't see it because there is no indication. So let's connect some LEDs to it. We connected a pair of LEDs, 
This one lights up when the outputs are low and the current goes from the positive supply rail through this LED into this output and into the zero volt rail. And when this output is high, the current goes from the supply rail through the output, through this LED and to the zero volt rail. So it's always one LED on and the other one off. I gave the components some values. These resistors are 560 ohms. It's not critical. It can be, for example, one kilo ohm as well. This resistor is 470 kilo ohms, and this capacitor is one microfarad ceramic capacitor. And the circuit looks like this. The LEDs are alternately blinking, but of course it's a good practice, as you can see, to connect a capacitor to the supply rails between the positive and the negative, like this for stability of the circuit. Typically this capacitor is from 100 microfarads to 1000 microfarads and it's an electrolytic capacitor which is polarized and it's negative for a zero volt terminal. It's marked using this stripe with a minus symbol which goes to the first pin of this chip. And how this circuit works? When the output is high, it basically charges via this resistor this capacitor and it's charged until it reaches two thirds of the supply voltage and then it flips and this output is low and via this resistor it discharges this capacitor until it reaches one third of the supply voltage and then the output flips back to high and it keeps repeating. So for example our supply voltage is six volts, a battery let's say. So the voltage at this capacitor and the inputs looks like this. The capacitor charges to two thirds of the supply voltage and discharges to one third and this keeps repeating. And the output pin 3 goes like this, 6 volts, 0 volts, 6 volts, 0 volts, while the inputs are going between 2 volts and 4 volts. But of course if the supply voltage was 12 volts it would be going between 4 volts and 8 volts. The threshold levels always depend on the supply voltage and these threshold levels are created by an internal resistive divider in the chip made of three resistors. And there is one last mysterious pin, pin 5, and this one is actually connected to this divider, to this spot on it. And this spot is actually used as the threshold value for the pin 6 and the voltage on this spot is used as the threshold voltage for the pin 2. And the pin 5 is very often unused, or it can be connected via a capacitor to the zero volt rail as some sort of a filter, so the threshold values are not influenced by the noise on the supply rail. And this capacitor typically is 100 nanofarads ceramic. Or this pin can also be used to manipulate the threshold values. You can externally change the voltage on this pin to change the threshold values for the pin 6 and 2 which in an oscillator influences the frequency and duty cycle at the output. But let's leave this pin for now and let's go back to our blinker and let's try to change the speed of it by changing the values of these two components. When I replace the 470 kilo ohm resistor using a 1 mega ohm resistor, it's blinking slower. The higher the resistance, the slower it is, the lower the frequency. And now I have an 82 kilo ohm resistor, which is a much lower resistance, so it should be much faster now. And it's blinking quite fast. Now let's replace the 1 microfarad capacitor in the oscillator using a 10 microfarad capacitor. A higher capacitance should make it slower again. And this one is electrolytic, it's polarized, so this pin has to go to the negative or zero volt rail and pin 1 of the chip. Let's replace the capacitor and a higher capacitance makes it run slower, the frequency is lower. Now let's make an oscillator with a variable frequency. I added a potentiometer in series with the resistor in the oscillator. Here you can see the potentiometer in the circuit and by turning the potentiometer I can change the speed. It's getting faster and even faster. And the slower again. And here's the schematic of it. And now let's try to build a beeper. I will use this small speaker for it. And the frequency has to be much higher for this. I will replace the one microfarad capacitor using a 100 nanofarad capacitor. A lower capacitance means a higher frequency. And it can be even higher. 
until it's so fast you can't even see it. So I added a speaker to the circuit and the speakers are connected to the output via a capacitor not directly so they only get the AC voltage not the DC and the frequency is quite low so it's clicking and when I increase it It's buzzing! And to get the frequency even higher, let's replace this 100 nanofarad capacitor using a 10 nanofarad capacitor. And now it's higher. And I can again adjust it. It works nicely. Now let's experiment with the pin 5. When I was a kid my favorite use for it was to connect a blinking LED to it. It's an LED with a blinker built into it. And this blinking LED when connected to a power supply just via a resistor blinks on its own thanks to its built-in blinking circuitry. Now let's try to connect it to the pin 5. It will go from the pin 5 to the 0 volt rail and always in LEDs the longer pin is the anode or the positive. So the longer pin goes to the pin 5. Let's turn it on. And let's add the LED. And we have a two-tone siren. And the LED is blinking but dimly. We removed these LEDs and... Now we have a two-tone siren. And of course it's schematic. And adding a resistor going from the positive to the pin 5 and the LED makes it blink brighter and changes the behavior a bit. And now let's go back from the beeper to the blinker to be able to demonstrate how to use the pin 7. He was previously connecting the oscillator resistor from the pin 3 to the pin 2, which makes the circuit a bit simpler, it saves one resistor. But the feedback for the oscillator can also go from the pin 7 to the pin 2 and 6. And this is actually the recommended way of doing it. Because if the resistor goes from the pin 3, the oscillator might be influenced by the load. So it might be better to use the output pin 3 just for the load and the pin 7 for the oscillator. But because the output 7 only switches to the 0 volt rail, not to the positive rail, it requires an additional pull-up resistor. So this is the main oscillator resistor and this is the pull-up resistor. And when you want a 50% duty cycle, which means the on time for each LED is roughly equal, you're using a much lower resistance for the pull-up resistor and a much higher resistance for the oscillator resistor. In this example I'm using just 10 kilo ohms here and 470 kilo ohms here. And because this one is much higher than this one, they blink about equally. But when this one has a higher value, in this example 470 kilo ohms and this one just 82 kilo ohms, they're blinking unequally. The green LED always stays on much longer than the red one. And with a 4.7 microfarad capacitor in the oscillator, which makes it slower. But again, unless this resistance is much lower than this one, the LEDs will blink unequally. And also regarding the resistors in the oscillator, it's not recommended to use extremely low or extremely high resistances. The lowest should be something like 4.7 kilo ohms and the highest about 2.2 mega ohms. Very low resistances slows the chip too much and with very high resistances the leakage currents show up. And this recommendation applies to both resistors here or the resistor here in the previous examples. And now I went back to these values which make an equally blinking oscillator because this one is much lower than this one. And now let's demonstrate the pin 4. Let's disconnect it from the positive and connect it to the zero volt rail. And when I do this, it will stop the oscillator. Now the output stay low, so the red LED is always on and the current goes like this. 
And of course, when these two resistors are used in the oscillator, the capacitor's charging via the series combination of both resistors, but it's discharging just via this resistor. The capacitor's charging from the positive rail through the two resistors, like this, and it's discharging we adjust this resistor and into the pin 7. And now the schematic is a proper mess. And one more example circuit with an added diode on this resistor in the oscillator. Now this capacitor is charging just via this resistor instead of the series combination. And it's discharging via this resistor. And this allows the LEDs to blink unequally the other way. Now the red one stays on longer. In other words, the duty cycle of the oscillator can now be below 50% instead of over 50%. Now the waveform is like this. When the green one stayed on longer, the waveform was like this. With the diode you can produce any duty cycle basically depending just on the ratio of these resistors. But without the diode, the duty cycle is always 50% or higher. And the 555 oscillator can basically produce square waves for many different purposes, from a fraction of a hertz up to several hundred kilohertz. And there are also some circuits with a 555 chip that are not oscillating. For example, a bistable circuit, which can flip between two LEDs, or can be used for just one to turn something on and off using push buttons, or a monostable circuit, basically a timer. But this video is getting too long, so if you're interested, I can talk about this in more detail in another episode. So that's it, and if you like my videos, please consider supporting this channel on Patreon, using the thanks button and subscribing. And a big thanks to all of you who already support me, because this channel couldn't exist without you. And a bonus circuit.